Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm giving you the 11th installment of my Evidence for Evolution series, and while this series does not have to be watched in order, this episode will be building on some things that we learned in the Sequence Homology episode, so if you're new to the series or if it's been a while since you watched the Sequence Homology one, consider watching that one first. It's not critical, but some of the stuff here will make a bit more sense if you have seen it first. This episode is going to be all about endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs for short. This is, in my opinion, probably the strongest line of evidence for evolution that exists. So let's take a look! Let's start with an explanation of what exactly an ERV even is. A virus, as you probably already know, is a type of not quite alive organism that is incapable of reproducing by itself. It must use another organism's cells as its machinery for producing more of itself. It will insert its DNA into the host cell, and the normal transcription process of the cell will then work on the viral DNA to produce more copies of the virus. A retrovirus, on the other hand, uses RNA as its genetic material. A DNA virus just has to plunk its DNA down into the cell, and the normal chemistry of the cell will go ahead and transcribe that DNA. But a retrovirus can't do that. Because it uses RNA as its genetic material rather than DNA, it must first find a way to turn that RNA into DNA for the host cell to transcribe. This is why it gets the prefix retro, because it has to reverse transcribe its RNA into DNA before anything can be done with it. Retro as a prefix essentially just means backward. The method that retroviruses have developed for accomplishing this task is to use an enzyme that is aptly named reverse transcriptase to transcribe the RNA in reverse back into DNA. And then it used another aptly named enzyme called integrase to integrate its genetic material directly into the host's DNA. Unlike a DNA virus whose presence will eventually kill the cell, there is not necessarily a significant detriment for a host cell that becomes infected, and occasionally the infection can even be beneficial. Every now and then, a retrovirus will infect the gametes of an organism, and so enter the germline. This is when a normal old retrovirus becomes endogenous. Endogenous in biology refers to something that originates inside of an organism. So a retrovirus that is not passed on genetically is an exogenous retrovirus. The organism must become infected with that virus externally, while one that is passed down genetically is endogenous. The organism will be born with it, so it comes from inside the organism. ERVs are easy to identify because they always have the same structure, and this structure matches modern retroviruses that still give us grief, like HIV. On either end of the retroviral DNA will be two identical sequences known as long terminal repeats, or LTRs. These sequences are essentially the first bits to infiltrate the host DNA, and their job, in an oversimplified nutshell, is to make space for the rest of the retroviral DNA in between them. In between the two LTR sequences, we find the genetic material to encode for three main proteins. Group antigens, abbreviated GAG, which are the proteins that make up the core of the virus, pole, which codes for the reverse transcriptase, and ENV, or ENV. I'm not sure if I'm actually supposed to be reading these out or just saying the letters, but uh, ENV is the envelope protein which codes for the envelope that makes up the body of the virus. Each individual virus is different, but they all have these same structures. So what do viruses hijacking our systems to reproduce have to do with evolution? Well, it's quite simple really. ERVs are essentially inserted into the genome of the host species at random, with there being, conservatively, about 50 million potential insertion points for the average grade ape genome. With the size of the genomes, and the random nature of the ERV insertion, the chance of two identical ERVs being inserted in the same location are minuscule. So by examining the various ERVs in the genomes of the different apes, we can begin to construct a phylogeny. I think an analogy would be helpful here, so I'm going to go ahead and steal one from Polygia. It's the best analogy I've heard so far, and I don't really see a need to reinvent the wheel here, so here we go. So let's say you have a hypothetical collection of ten books that are all different from each other but have differing degrees of similarity. In looking at the books, you can see that page 20 is identical across all ten books. But on that page, seven of the ten books have a stain of pasta sauce that is identical in shape and location. 
While there is an incredibly minuscule chance that seven individual pasta sauce splattering events created an identical splattering pattern on the page, it is far more likely that there was a splatter on the original and then the other copies were photocopied from that. So the three unsplattered copies were made, then the splatter happened, then the seven splattered copies were made. So we can see that all ten books shared a common book ancestor, but the seven splattered books are more closely related to each other than to the unsplattered books. So then we notice that in the splattered books, page 24 is also identical, but in four of the books there is an identical scribbling in the corner on page 24. Again, the most parsimonious explanation is that while these pages were being photocopied, three of the copies were made before the scribbling, and four were made after. And we can also determine that the scribbling happened after the pasta sauce splatter. But in the books that lack the scribble, page 17 is also identical, and two pages of page 17 have an identical ink stain on them. So using this information, we can arrange the books in a nested hierarchy, and we can determine the relationship each book has to the other books, and we can also construct a timeline of when these page-altering events would have happened, roughly. In this analogy, the text of the book represents the genome of the organism, and the external modifications to the book, the stains and scribbles and whatnot, are the viruses. Now of course this analogy is imperfect, because books don't reproduce sexually last time I checked, so they're not actually reproductively related to each other, but it does kind of help get the idea across. With each ERV, there are three individual data points that can be used to construct an independent phylogeny. First, there is just the general distribution of ERVs as a whole among the different taxa, which provides the overall timeline. Second, using the methods that I described in the sequence homology video, we are able to construct phylogenies based on the differences between the same ERV in the same locations on the genomes in two different species. If you'll recall, after two populations are isolated from each other, their genetic material will accumulate different mutations. These differences can be statistically mapped out in the creation of a phylogeny, and the presence of an ERV makes this relatively easy. Third, each ERV has two LTR sequences on either end. Because of how retroviruses work, these LTR sequences need to have been identical when the virus was inserted, or the viral insertion would simply have failed. Because we know that each LTR had to be identical, we can use both LTRs to construct two independent phylogenies, and any variation in the phylogeny will necessarily be the result of an event other than the accumulation of neutral mutations that these phylogenies rely on, and so provides a powerful error-correcting mechanism. So because each ERV that is present across multiple species can be used to construct four independent phylogenies, one from the general distribution of the ERV, one from studying the sequence homology of the ERV, and two from the LTRs, we have four independent phylogenies that can be used to check the work of the other three. And on top of that, there are literally hundreds of these ERVs that have been used to construct phylogenies within the great ape families, all of which are in high agreement with each other. Now, if you'll remember back to my sequence homology video, a phylogeny based on genetics alone will not necessarily match up with a phylogeny made with species names. This is because our relatively arbitrary labeling system does not always perfectly reflect nature, and indeed it likely never will, as nature doesn't need to conform to our labels for it. So genes are free to mutate and change within a single species, as such, phylogenies of ERVs are usually constructed based on the ERV itself, rather than just slapping some species' names on them. This is because it is entirely possible for two independent ERVs to become fixed in a population of the organism at separate times, without there having been a speciation event in between. This is actually why, when constructing genetic phylogenies from any data, the researchers will usually use the name of the gene or the ERV, with some sort of other indicator used on the chart to represent the different taxa. Now ERVs are not only good evidence for evolution, there is also evidence that ERVs have helped drive evolution. The LTRs of these retroviruses contain different regulatory sequences that will affect how the neighboring genes are expressed. So if they land in the right spot on a genome, they could, in one fell swoop, have a dramatic effect on how the host genes are expressed or even if they are expressed. Usually this results in disease, like cancer, and possibly autoimmune diseases. But very occasionally, it can have a beneficial effect. For instance, the virus's need of evading their host's immune system has caused them to develop immunosuppressant characteristics in some cases. 
Placental mammals have co-opted this effect to help with the local suppression of the immune system during pregnancy, so that way the mother's body will not attack the embryo. And this has been accomplished in slightly different ways in different mammals by co-opting different ERVs in a fantastic demonstration of convergent evolution. So ERVs, by their nature, are unlikely to be inserted into the same place on two different genomes. However, an insertion in the germline will yield offspring with the same ERV in the same location as the parent. Therefore, when we see hundreds of ERVs that are identically placed in the genomes of different animals, the most parsimonious conclusion is that these animals shared a common ancestor whose germline was infected with the retrovirus. And when we construct phylogenies based on this data, we can construct up to four phylogenies for each individual ERV, and ERVs make up a significant amount of any mammalian genome, anywhere from 8 to 10 percent. We can then compare these hundreds to thousands of individually generated phylogenies and find that they are in high agreement with each other and high agreement with the phylogenies constructed with different methods. This indicates a relationship between the species that share this viral DNA over evolutionary time. In other words, common ancestry. Thanks for watching, subscribe if you're enjoying the series, and consider supporting the show for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino. See you next time!